I wonder what they're doing in there. Each of us probably has had a, a time or two in our lives where the door has shut and we've been left out of an important meeting and we were left to wonder, what are they talking about? What's going on in there? Maybe when you were a kid, you saw it take place when a sibling was in trouble and they were in a room being disciplined by mom or dad. As you went to school, maybe it was when a, a friend or a classmate got sent to the principal's office. Or potentially as you watched the big game, either in person or on the television, and the, the teams head off uh, at halftime, you wonder what's going on in the locker room. What's the coach saying? Or in adulthood, at your place that you work, as the boardroom door closes and there's a manager's meeting going on, we would love to know what they're saying behind those closed doors. Because so often, important meetings happen behind closed doors. We see that in this book, in, in John chapter 16, we've seen this for a few uh, weeks now as we've been looking through John 13, 14, 15, and now 16, Jesus draws his closest friends. As his time is winding down, he draws the disciples in for a closed door meeting, so to speak. The good news for us is that we are privy to the words that Jesus shared with them because it's throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we see Jesus and hear what he had to say as he was getting close to the end before his death on the cross. And we hear him teach his disciples all about what life will be like after he leaves. That they don't need to be in fear because when he leaves, he's going to prepare a place for them. We know it, of course, from the story of the, the mansion that Jesus is making for his people. We see Jesus models what a leader looks like, a servant leader, as he gets down on the ground and he washes his disciples' dirty, rugged feet. We see Jesus tell them how they need to stay connected to the vine. And after he leaves, they'll have the, the Holy Spirit who will be there with them, an advocate, a, a comforter, he has described. And the Holy Spirit would do great things, starting specifically at Pentecost. Now we're getting close to the end of this meeting, so to speak. If you would, turn in your Bibles today to John chapter 16, and we'll start actually in verse 16. Again, John 16, 16. Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and, and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, 
you will ask me in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then the Jesus disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you believe? Jesus replied. A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So after looking more at this text, there's, there's three things that I want to walk through with you today. And the first is this, the power of a story. I would guess that you know somebody who knows how to make a story come alive. Uh, maybe an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a neighbor. They're, when they're telling a story, your attention is squarely on them. They know how to make something come to life. They know how to make something appear bigger than it is or, or draw something out that makes you understand it in a way you didn't at first. Jesus was a master storyteller. In the book of Matthew, he writes about some of the more famous parables that Jesus told. He says that, that Jesus didn't tell or didn't say anything that day without using a parable. Jesus knew the power of a story. He fully understood the human interest in such. In this chapter that we just read, Jesus was kind of playing a game, so to speak, with the guys. He was playing around with them. In a little while you'll see me no more, then in a little while you'll see me again. Is this like some sort of a game of hide and seek or something that Jesus is talking about? And the, the disciples Jesus could tell in their body language that what was happening, John was among them as he's thinking about what he's going to write, that the murmuring was, is this some type of a riddle? Is Jesus going on a, a trip somewhere? Or what is he talking about? Where is he going? If I were to put this into a more modern context, a, a way that I often hear my kids or students uh, say, uh, I'm so confused. And so Jesus notices them fidgeting then. And so he continues the, the process, the, the situation. He continues to help them by giving them not a story yet, but a promise. Very truly, I tell you, the way we probably would say it, in other words, trust me when I say this, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. He, of course, was telling them about his, his arrest, about his impending death, that he would leave them, that they would be filled with grief, that the disciples would be shocked and devastated, while the community around them, the people that wanted Jesus dead, they would be celebrating the death of an alleged blasphemer who claimed to be God. But the disciples' shock, their anguish would actually turn to joy, Jesus tells them, when Jesus came back from the dead. And then he goes from promise to parable or, or story. He says, it's like childbirth. Like Jesus does here, the writers of, of the Bible often use an analogy, a metaphor of childbirth throughout the Old Testament, from prophet to New Testament parable and apostle. We see the, the power of, or the analogy, the picture of childbirth. And I, I think the reasoning behind it is, well, no matter what era we live in, thousands of years ago or even today, 
It makes sense. We get it. Because ladies, I don't know how you do it when it comes to childbirth. As a father of four children and a witness uh, to each of their births, I can truly say that it is a horribly beautiful thing to witness. Watching the, the pain and the toil and anguish that a woman goes through is excruciating. The contractions growing in pain and lessening in time between. The body preparing to do what seems to be biologically impossible. Pain, tension, and anguish throughout, peaking at the moment of delivery. But then, that first cry. The sight of that precious little one that's been growing inside their mama. Which makes a worn down and exhausted mom so excited as she holds that baby for the first time, knowing that what she just went through was completely worth it. Jesus says to the, his friends then, guys, there's going to be some painful, some brutal times ahead. But the pain and the grief won't last forever. And when it's over, there will be joy that will never end. Childbirth. A story that makes his teaching come to life. Oh. I get it now. The disciples would say then, and we could even say today. Power of a story. So parents, let me ask you this. Are you using the power of story or example uh, to teach your kids bigger truths about God? The opportunities to do so, they come up all the time. You just need to be aware. You need to be able to be creative in a moment, sometimes even having something planned out. I don't necessarily say that this is a story, but maybe more of an example. This past week, our students, our Fusion Youth Group kids got together, and it was a wonderful thing after being uh isolated or, or only seeing each other through a computer screen for the past two months or so, uh, it was great to be together. And so we went out and we hiked on the Raven Trail uh, out by Clear Lake. And, and as we were hiking, we had gone for uh, a couple miles or so. It was time for a break. And so we took a break right down by Clear Lake. And I, I just got thinking as I looked out into the lake and I shared with the students, imagine just for a moment as you look out at that lake, what it would feel like if you looked out there and you saw a man and he wasn't in a boat, but he was walking on the water. And then as he came closer to you, you saw that it was Jesus, your, your friend, somebody that you had seen do all of these things. What would it have been like to be one of those disciples? What, what would the wrestle have been like inside of you as you, you try to, to think through, what does this mean? How is this happening? Is this really happening? Am I dreaming? Is that a ghost, one of them, as you know, said? What would it have been like for them? What would you have thought if you were one of them? Never underestimate the power of a good story. Jesus didn't. The second takeaway from the text is Jesus sets forth a new relationship between God and man. We see that in the middle of this passage. You see, in that day, no longer then would the people of God have to go to the temple to be with God, Jesus says. No longer would they have to go through a priest for a sacrifice to get forgiveness or to go to a priest to have their prayers heard by God. Instead, after Jesus went away, as he described, and came back again, 
it would change everything about the relationship between God and man. A believer in Jesus would now have direct access to God the Father through the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. I, like you, have used those words often in my life. And I, I have to say, I, I think a lot of us, a lot of the time, have misunderstood it. Thinking that in Jesus' name was some type of a, a magical formula to getting what we wanted from God. And I think that's at least partially why, why some folks find it necessary to be added to the end of each and every prayer. What if, what if instead asking in Jesus' name wasn't about three special words, but instead about being connected to Jesus through an active faith in him as we lived out a life in Jesus' name by staying connected to the vine as we remember from John chapter 15. Jesus goes on to say here that the Father loves a disciple because they have loved and have believed in him. Have loved, have believed. It, it wasn't just something that happened once. No, this love and belief in Jesus is a continued action, a continuing action. You see, the moment or the, excuse me, the authentic Christian life is not a moment of belief, but instead a moment moving forward into a lifetime of believing. In Jesus' name is an ongoing belief in him. You see, when we ask in Jesus' name, as in we're connected to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will get what we ask for, so to speak, or what we want, because what we want is that God's will would be done in our very lives. Now, because this conversation has such major implications, I want to go through the basics a little bit. You, you might know it as the gospel about what a follower of Jesus is actually believing in. To, to put ourselves in Jesus' name, in a life of continued belief, continuing belief. What does that mean? Well, the first thing is recognizing that there is a perfect, holy, and sinless Creator God who created everything, including you and me, us humans. Humans who were made perfect, instead though, chose to sin, tried to, to get the omniscience that only God has, the ability to know all things. And that sin that was there with Adam and Eve has gone down to each and every human being since, and that sin separates human beings from God. That sin is so strong that it needs to be fixed. It needs a savior. But we try to be our own savior by, by doing good works or by trying to just be a little bit better. But being our own savior doesn't work because we'd never get there. We'd never get to that point of doing enough. The only savior that we can have is the one God himself sent to earth, Jesus Christ. Jesus' death and resurrection would give us the Holy Spirit then and also gave us direct access to our holy and perfect God. In Old Testament times, it meant no more curtain in the temple. No more priest to go through to access God. Belief in Jesus as the only Savior from our sins is what makes us right before God. And that leads us then into a new relationship for all those who believe. 
And one last thing then about that new relationship, that it, what it brings in verse 33 is this, peace. Now in our world, we often associate peace with tranquility, right? The peace that Jesus offers, though, is different than experiencing calm feelings while we listen to the sound of ocean waves, waves or something. The peace that Jesus offers is a complete well-being knowing who you are in Christ. And then our final piece of our three that I want to talk about today is that you're going to need that peace. You're going to need that peace because as Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have troubles, trials, or tribulation, depending on which Bible translation you use. Trials, tribulation, or trouble. There's not a more fitting time in my lifetime that I've seen this, and, and I would guess in yours as well, for us to be able to understand trouble or trials or tribulation. It just feels like it just keeps coming, doesn't it? From a global pandemic to a pending economic collapse to systemic injustice and social unrest. These are most certainly troublesome times. And my personal opinion is that these times might actually continue to get worse for a while. And it won't surprise me at all if it lasts for a while. Now maybe I'm not supposed to say that to you this morning as a pastor. Maybe I'm supposed to give you hope that the world is going to get better. But I'm not sure it will. But take heart. Because Jesus has overcome the world. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you want to be overcomers? Do you want to overcome the world that is filled with trial, trouble, and tribulation? Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It is in walking through these difficult times that we realize our deep need for God. As the psalmist says, our walking through the valley of weeping will instead become a place of refreshing springs. As hard as it is for us to admit or see sometimes, our suffering brings us closer to God. And it also reminds us that Jesus is the victor. He's the overcomer. The victory has already been determined. And believers in him will overcome. And therefore then, as we live today, we act in hope. Being reminded of what the Lord himself requires of us. And that is that we act justly. That we love mercy and that we 
walk humbly with our God. Join me as we live that out together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We, Jesus, we thank you that as we look to the world around us of chaos and uncertainty, we can be certain that you have overcome, that you are the victor, and that our lives can show light to the world around us. Lord, help us to do that during dark days, not only for America, but really for the whole world as we face things that we're not used to. God, change us. Help us to be filled with hope during these uncertain times. We trust you, God. We love you. Amen.